Money, eh? <laughs> well, whether you like it or not, it dominates much of our lives. In many ways, it's as essential to modern life as air and water. But if you stop for a minute and look closely at it, what do we actually know about it? Well, when faced with such important questions, we should ask the experts, musicians. It's been sung about by everyone from the Beatles to Biggie Smalls, even bloody Abba. <laughs> and so we know that money can't buy your love. And we also know that the love of money is the root of all evil. And we definitely know that money doesn't grow on trees. In fact, that last statement is a bit more profound than it first appears. Because money doesn't grow on trees. Neither do we mine it, farm it or hunt it. We actually make it up. It's the ultimate human abstraction. Right? Even this kind of money that I can hold in my hand right here, it's got no value in and of itself. It's a £20 note. It's just a piece of paper. It has value to me because I have faith that at some point in the future, I'm going to be able to swap this piece of paper for something of real value, like food or shelter or a funky new shirt. <laughs> but just like many ubiquitous things in life, uh, we don't often question money. It just is. But if we look more closely and ask questions such as, where does money come from? Um, who creates it? And why does it often seem like there's not enough to go around in a crisis? Well, things become decidedly murky. Now, before I go on to address some of these questions, I should address another question first. Why me? Why am I standing here today talking to you about money? Surely these are questions for economists and bankers to answer. Well, the fact is that there's a misunderstanding of money. And I don't just mean amongst everyday people like me and you. I mean even amongst many politicians, economists and bankers. Now, that's a bold statement, but it's not my statement. Like, the more I read about money, the more I kept coming across leading individuals saying the same thing. And here's three quotes from top people to illustrate my point, although I could have read you many, many more. The way monetary economics and banking is taught in many, maybe most universities, is very misleading. The money multiplier model should be discarded immediately. Macroeconomic textbooks are largely silent on the role of banks as creators of money. Now, apologies for the hellish jargon, but underneath all of that, those three quotes are basically saying the same thing. And that's that money is often taught wrong. Now, I'm not standing here today to slag off the work that some economists, politicians and bankers do. This talk is not an attack on anyone. But if our assumptions about money itself are wrong, then any analysis, theory or policy that follows is in grave danger of being false. So how does money actually work? Well, if you ask the man in the street, he might come up with an image of everlasting tokens created by the Bank of England on behalf of the government. And that intuitive understanding of money comes from our everyday experience. We exchange a £20 note bearing the stamp of the Bank of England for some goods and services, and the next owner of this note does the same, and so this £20 note will circulate around our economy. Now, this model of everlasting tokens is how money could work, and maybe should work. And it's actually how a small part of our money does work, namely our notes and coins. But the thing is, those notes and coins make up a small fraction of the total amount of money available to us to spend. The accepted figure from Bank of England statistics is just 3% of all the money in the UK takes the form of notes and coins. So what about the rest of it? Well, the other 97% of our money is created by the private banking sector whenever they make loans. It is loaned into existence at the same instance as a credit, uh, an interest-bearing debt is created for the same amount. Now, you may have heard of this process called double-entry bookkeeping, or maybe a bank expanding its balance sheet. But whatever the jargon is, uh, it doesn't function at all like everlasting tokens, that image. Uh, a good term for it is credit money. And it functions not like everlasting tokens, but more like spendable IOUs. So how can we understand how spendable IOUs function? Well, to do that, let's just focus on how a normal IOU would work. So, my mate Ted wants to borrow a tenner, so he comes up to me, asks for a tenner, in return for the tenner, he gives me an IOU. Basically, he's promised to pay me back £10 at some point in the future. IOU, £10, love Ted. Now, there's two important properties of this IOU. Firstly, it has value to me because I know and trust Ted, but it doesn't have any value to anyone that doesn't. Secondly, it has a limited lifespan. Once Ted pays me back the £10, the IOU becomes essentially worthless. It expires. 
OK, so Ted could go around everyone he knows giving them his personal AOUs, but that's very inconvenient for everybody. So instead, what Ted does is he goes to the bank and he gives the bank his IOU. And in return for his IOU, the bank gives him some of their IOUs. So in return for Ted's promise to pay the bank back £10 in the future, they give him £10 of their IOUs. And the difference between their IOUs and Ted's IOUs is that those IOUs are spendable. Because you're not taking Ted's word anymore, you're taking the bank's word. But what's the same about those two IOUs is that they both have a limited lifespan. So the spendable IOUs that the bank issues also have a limited lifespan. When Ted pays back the bank the £10 that he owes them, those £10 of IOUs vanish. So essentially, when the loan is repaid, £10 of money is destroyed. Now, I feel I should point out here something very important, that when I'm talking about spendable IOUs, I'm not talking about something mysterious. I'm talking about the money in your bank. Now, you could have a look at your bank statement. You could have a positive balance if you're lucky. And, and you, could, you could swap that positive balance for some cash money if you wanted to. In other words, you can make the bank make good on its promise to pay on its IOU. But really, we rarely do that. We might buy coffee and a beer with cash, but generally most of our transactions these days are just transferring money from one bank account to another via direct debits or internet bank transfers. So the spendable IOUs that the banks are creating whenever they make a loan become our money. So to sum up so far, 97% of all the money out there in the UK is credit money. It functions like spendable IOUs, it is created by banks whenever they make loans. It circulates around our economy for a while and is eventually destroyed. So what kind of dynamics do we get from that? What kind of effect does it have on the total amount of money in circulation? Well, a really nice image is that of a bathtub. The total amount of water in the bathtub at any one time represents the total amount of money available to us to spend at any one time. But the thing is, we've got the tap on and the plug out. So, New money's flooding into the bath whenever loans are made, and new money's flooding out of the bank whenever loans are repaid and money's destroyed. Now you can imagine if these two rates are equal, we have a nice steady amount of money in circulation. But in reality, that's not the case. That's almost impossible to achieve. And those two rates are unequal, and we have a very unstable dynamic. The money's either increasing or decreasing. And in fact, we can have a look at the UK bathtub of money, so the last 40 odd years of money in the UK, and it's the purple line that looks a bit like a mountain. And you can see it's been increasing rapidly for most of the last 40 years, except at the end bit when we hit the financial crisis. Now I should point out that the blue line at the bottom is the amount of notes and coins in circulation. So you can see the change in the relative importance of notes and coins versus bank created spendable IOUs. Now, what's happened, though, when we hit the financial crisis is the amount of money in circulation has actually been falling. So basically, the taps turned down to a trickle as banks lost faith in each other and we lost faith in things such as the housing market and were reluctant to borrow. So less new money's been created, but money's still gushing out of the plug hole. So we find ourselves in a situation where there's literally not enough money to go around. Now, nobody wants this. The government certainly didn't want it, and they stepped in and tried to intervene, but the tools they have available to them are ineffective at best. Um, first of all, they acted as guarantor of last resort, which is basically underwriting the bank's spendable IOUs of a taxpayer guarantee. Then the Bank of England and the Monetary Policy, Policy Committee tried to get banks lending again. And they did that by lowering the base interest rate as low as it will go, and then through the thing we've all heard of quantitative easing. So basically, their solution is to try and get the tap turned back on again. Now, right there is the paradox at the heart of our money system. If we want more money in our economy, we have to take on more debt. If we want less debt around, we have to put up with less money. Under the current system, it's impossible to have less debt, but more money. Now, let's just stop for a second and consider how crazy this situation actually is. We've allocated the power and privilege of money creation to the private financial sector. Banks are businesses, but when things go wrong, we step in and deem them too big to fail. We give them taxpayer guarantees, massive financial subsidies and bailouts, meaning they're not subject to any market discipline at all. 
Another way of saying too big to fail is that we socialise the risk but privatise the reward. Or maybe another way is that risk and reward aren't pro properly aligned. Now, it gets even crazier when you realise the government itself has to borrow from these private banks, even though the money it's borrowing only has any value now because it's backed by the government. Now, that's bizarre and a little scary. So, why not just let the bank, bad banks go bust? Well, when you hear a bank's been termed too big to fail, they actually are. Because if the banks fail, then all of the spendable IOUs that they've issued fail as well. And in that instance, basically 97% of our money supply would become essentially worthless. One way to think about banks that's quite nice is not that they store our money, but that they are the money. Without their accounting entries and payment systems, there is no money. Now, I would love to have the time here to explore all the consequences of a credit-based money system, all of its links with housing bubbles, the widening inequality gap, the erosion of democratic accountability, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. Instead, what I'd like to do with the remaining time is ask, could it be any different? And the simple answer is, of course. You know, money's the ultimate object of human design. We make it, so we can make it differently. Maybe a better question is, could we design it better? Now, there's loads of exciting experiments going on all around the world at the moment, things such as local currencies, mutual credit systems, time banks, but they don't address the problem we're looking at here. The problem we're looking at here is to do with our primary currency, pound sterling in this case. So can we design that differently? Can we design that better? Well, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Let's not start coming up with radical new designs. Let's just consider what would happen if we made all of our money, both physical and digital, behave as everlasting tokens instead of spendable IOUs. Now, that system is sometimes referred to as full reserve banking. And the basic premise is that you take the power and privilege of money creation away from the private sector and you put it in the hands of a transparent, accountable public body. And they are able to make long-term decisions about our money supply based on things such as inflation or unemployment. Note that we're not putting it in the hands of the government because there's a massive conflict of interest there too. But the thing is, we already have such a transparent, accountable public body in the Monetary Policy Committee, whose job is supposed to be to control our money supply. But as we've seen, they do not have the tools and levers to effectively carry out their job. Now, if we move to full reserve banking, basically what we're doing is we're putting the plug in the bath and then giving the control of the tap to an accountable body. New money would be created debt-free as everlasting tokens, and that money would be spent into the economy by a democratically elected government. Now, they could spend it on investing in public infrastructure, transitioning to a green economy, or they could use it to lower taxes, or in fact, they could give it directly to the citizens. The point being that this change would be politically neutral, in the sense that both left and right-wing governments can use the money as they see fit. But despite being politically neutral, it would certainly strengthen our democratic core and principles. Now, I'm not standing here today to try and sell you full reserve banking. Although, personally, I can see far more pros than cons to it. I brought it up because I didn't want to fall into the classic trap of highlighting a problem without offering an alternative. What I hope my talk has achieved is three things. Firstly, to give you a better understanding of how money actually works. Secondly, to help you realise that money is something that we can redesign, something that we can change to work differently if the will exists. And thirdly, for you to realise that all of these pressing financial and economic problems that we face today are our problems. They're not the problems of the elite, they are our problems, and we should feel empowered to get out there and engage with these problems. And in fact, if you look at the ancient Greek roots of the word economics, it literally translates as home management. So surely, the best people to engage with these issues are everyday folk, such as me and you, such as my mum. Maybe we need a new term for it, common sense economics. Or I quite like the ring to mumonomics. <laughs> but to conclude, <laughs> to conclude, I, I don't know what the future's going to look like, but what I'm convinced of is that if we want any control whatsoever over what our collective human legacy will be, we need to gain a better understanding and control over one of our greatest inventions. If we change money, we'll change the world. Thank you.